So I think we're ready to start. So um, thanks for everyone for being here. This is my first uh, DrupalCon. I'm Tina Williams. I'm from IBM. And I'm going to share a little bit about our story um, with globalization using Drupal. Um, my colleague, Anne-Marie Shepard, um, is not able to be with us, but I have a demo partway through the presentation um, that you'll hear um, from her. And also, the end of the presentation, she's our engineering lead, um, will be more of the slides that she would have covered. Um, but I'll just cover those today. We have a lot of material. Um, we've broken every rule of, of conference um, by having way too much information on each of the slides. But hopefully, it'll be a good reference um, for any of you that are um, pursuing globalization with Drupal. So let me get started. So we're going to cover today um, the four keys of success. And for us, that was really about first developing a geo-focused strategy. Um, with IBM, we have 137 locations um, on our website around the world. Um, then we also wanted to transform our processes, and that was to become more efficient. Finally, we wanted to redefine our roles so we could have more ownership in our geo sites. Our geos um, are responsible for their revenue targets, so we wanted to give them full control of their digital presence. And then finally, we wanted to have a CMS platform that supported our globalization strategy. So what were our problems? We had, um, from a user experience standpoint, we had inconsistent languages being deployed across all of our business units. IBM has many different business units, and they were all operating independently and making choices them themselves about which languages to deploy and where to deploy. So we also had a content issue in our geos, where some geographies would have all of our portfolio. Some other geographies, some other countries and regions would only have portions of our IBM portfolio. So we needed more consistency there. Um, we also um, didn't have a good model for delivery of content into the geography. So we could have our local market teams running campaigns, and then all of a sudden they'd get a new page into their market, or their page that they were using for their campaign would be overwritten by our worldwide teams. So we wanted to address that issue and give them more power into the content that was coming into the market. Um, we also were having extreme delays in our globalization effort. It could take up to 12 weeks for us to translate pages and get them deployed into our local markets. So we knew we needed to have some, a better way to do this uh, much faster and address the issues. And one of the primary problems we were having was we were using in-market marketing resources to validate our content. And that was where we were really running into time, because Joe, the marketing guy, didn't really have time to validate the translation. Or if he did do it, he would completely rewrite it. And so we didn't want to have that rewriting of our messaging um, in the local markets. And we just really didn't want to be using a volunteer resource for that activity. So we made a change there. Um, and then finally, the, the platform. At the time um, that we started, we had, I'd say, five different legacy systems um, with marketing page content. And we wanted to move to a single, consistent CMS for all of our pages. And we first moved to um, all of our worldwide pages over. And that was in 2017 and 2018. And there's a talk from Seattle from the team that did that migration. I'm going to focus on, now that we have the content, our worldwide content in Drupal, how did we globalize that content? So this is just another picture to show you just how um, complex um, our sites were. This is actually from 2016, um, where we, we were looking across all of the different sites. And for our home page, we had 140 countries in 37 different languages. We had, um, for our, some of our uh, product catalog and our software catalogs weren't even synced up. They were going to different languages in different countries. Our legacy um, product lines, like our mainframes, um, were going out to a much larger number of uh, languages and locales. But then our new product lines, like our cloud, um, IBM Cloud, 
we're going to fewer markets and fewer languages really targeted on the, the new market opportunity. So the result was really a disjointed user experience. So in Uz Uzbekistan, we had deployed an IBM.com homepage in 2015, and half of the content on that page was um, in Russian um, and uh, Uzbek and other languages. And then the content itself was so out of date, it was promoting a conference in 2015 in Las Vegas. Um, so we don't even run that conference anymore. So we had a, an issue with even keeping content maintained in these markets. Um, and then you'd see, you know, Tom in Croatia might be able to find the homepage in our, our legacy systems sites. Um, someone in Germany, almost all of our sites were um, being kept up to date um, for Germany and for the U.S. market. Everybody there was happy and could find everything. But then as you started to go to some of our more minor markets, like Aruba, we had our whole product catalog. Did we really need it there? So we really were looking at where do we need content? Who are the... Who are our, um, is our audience in these markets, and how can we best serve them? So we developed a strategy um, where we wanted to look at what um, consistent languages could we set up. So we have a, a market development insights research team within IBM, and we asked them to go look at all of the different markets, understand um, the proficiency in the different languages for our specific audience. So for someone that's buying IT related services. Um, and then also looking at where do we have marketing resources um, and what is their language proficiency and also our, our sales resources. So we wanted to align all of this to make sure that we came up with a set of standard languages that were sufficient for our markets, but also and also aligned to the resources that we had. Um, so we didn't just decide this. We got the research from our team. Then we went out to each of the geography leads, and we talked to them about the languages, because we, are, of course, were going to take away some languages that we were supporting. We got their agreement. And then we turned around and went to each of the business units in IBM and talked to them about making this change as well. So we really took the time to socialize um, the research, get the buy-in, and then we said, okay, this is going to be the standards. So we didn't dictate it. We worked together with all of the organizations to make sure everyone was in agreement. Um, the next thing we did was we decided on the lo locales that we wanted to focus on, so the countries and regions that were important. And again, we went out to the geographies and talked to them about Let's look at your traffic. Let's look at the revenue coming in. Where do you see your emerging markets? Where do you see your declining markets? Where do we really need to have content? And where do we just really need a brand presence? Um, the next thing we did after we knew the languages, the countries we wanted to support, we set up um, the staffing model to support that. Um, followed by a whole new set of processes and process improvement to make globalization run much quicker. And at the end, we gave the ownership to the pages going into the market to the new resources that we put in place. And then finally, and there's, this is intentionally the last thing, we worked with our engineering team to customize our Drupal implementation to support all of our needs. Um, so these are the standard languages that we agreed to. Um, we actually added Arabic, um, so that was a challenge because we have to be able to support the Arabic language um, within the system and rendering. Um, but we'll, we'll be going back um, and revisiting this over time. So I do get calls from different geo leaders, and they say, can we please add this language? And my first question is, okay, what sellers do you have in place? What marketing resources do you have in place to support this new language if we enable it within the system? We do allow our local markets to still um, create and publish pages in their local language um, if they have a need, but they have to totally own those pages. They have to own the maintenance of the pages and the content for those pages. Um, and that's pretty much to support 
um, local campaigns, local events, um, and they can also have um, local case studies. So part of our content um, strategy was to really think, how could we model our content um, in a simple way that we could be really efficient in the way that we are deploying out to the markets? Um, so um, one of our areas, our security business unit, said, you know what? Um, in some markets, we only need marketing pages. In other markets, it's sufficient enough if I have my product pages. Um, so if you think about the different types of pages you might have on your site, um, those are two of our primary um, types of pages on our marketing sites. So for our worldwide site, we have all of the content. We have the home page. We have our legal pages. Um, we have all of our worldwide marketing pages, our product catalog that's full of our product pages. Um, but as we, we started to think about the geo markets, we, we said, OK, well, let's define some tiers. So the first tier is really about um, replicating the worldwide site with just a less amount of content. So maybe we have 100 pages for a business unit on our worldwide site. We don't need all of those 100 pages um, on our geo sites, on our tier one sites. So some subset, maybe 20%, um, 30% of those pages would be deployed to the tier one market but not out to our tier two or tier three. In the tier two, we decided it would be sufficient enough just to have the product pages. And then in the minor markets, we really just have our IBM.com homepage um, and a, a little bit of other minimal content just to keep the content fresh um, on a quarterly basis. So um, we went out to the geographies and asked them also to classify which market fit into which model. So we defined the model centrally, but then we went out to the geographies and got them to decide on their own which markets they wanted to classify as tier one, tier two, and minor based on their revenue targets. And then after we defined all that, we again went back to all the business unit leaders and met with them one by one and shared this new model and got their buy-in. So there was a lot of socializing around the content model as well. Um, so the next thing we did, now that we had a content model, we, we were trying to think, how is the most efficient way to manage IBM.com in 137 locales? So we said, what if we would set up some of our locales to be parents of other locales so that we would really only have to maintain the parent, but the child locale would inherit any, any changes that we make to the parent. So we again went out to our ge geography leads and said, if we set up this structure, what, who would be the parent, who would be the child in your markets? Um, and so each one of them defined um, how they would want to be set up. So for in our MIA market, we have um, UAE is the parent for both Saudi Arabia and Libya. But um, South Africa comes directly off of our English master because we, um, that part of, of Africa, um, their, their messaging, their graphics, everything would be much different than it would be in UAE and Saudi Arabia and Libya. So um, we set up these inheritance models and Drupal um, does a really great job of supporting us with this. So I would say that's probably, that's one of the many benefits we have from Drupal, but this is very significant because it allows us to be very efficient in our management of the websites. OK, sorry. I was hitting the wrong button. Um, so um, we also are doing the same thing for other languages. So the, other, the previous slide was about the English language um, locales. We start with our worldwide site and create our English master kind of as our snapshot in time that we globalize. And then we create our um, other language masters, so like our German language master and our French language master. And again, we set up those parent-child relationships. Um, again, working back with the geography teams. 
So that was our content model. So the next thing we did was really focused around our process and roles. And how could we make um, the globalization process much more efficient? So if you, we considered the steps, the one through nine steps of preparing for globalization, initiating it, trans, going through translation, validating your translation, approving your translation, and then moving on with creating locale pages, um, publishing those locale pages, and then doing optimization and localization around the pages in the local market. So the places in, the, in our older process that we updated were that during our initiate phase, instead of having the worldwide teams just shove out new pages and no one knows about it, we now require our worldwide teams to brief our geo teams on any changes that are coming um, through the globalization process. And our geo teams have a week to um, raise their hand and say, hey, you know, that's not enough pages, or wait, that's way too many pages, or ask questions um, about the content that's coming to them. Um, so that's worked out really well. It's a very structured package that we've put together um, that they have to complete. It's a lot of work. But the feedback we've also gotten from our worldwide teams is that it's a nice package for them, that they've never really thought of having all of that information together at the same time. And it, it includes information about really thinking about what are the assets on the page that are being linked to, what redirects need to happen as the pages are being deployed, um, and a lot of other detailed information that really helps the, our geo teams prepare. Um, the next thing that we did different was we moved away from translation validation and using our in-market resources, marketing resources, to do that work. Um, we knew they were rewriting the content. They were slow. It just wasn't their job. Um, so instead, we now pay our translation service to do what we call translation QA. And we use new capabilities in Drupal um, to allow for side-by-side comparison, but also a preview of the content in context. So they can look for grammar and um, syntax issues that aren't caught during normal translation. So that's the space where I'll be sharing you, with you a little bit about where we um, did some customization around the TMG MT module to support, support that. Um, and then the last part that we changed was the approve and publish. So like I said before, we wanted to give ownership to our geo teams. So we now have web managers in each of our geographies, and they're the ones that receive the briefing materials and prepare. And then they know that the content is coming, but they have the right to publish. They're the only ones that have content approval um, to publish the new pages live. They are also the only ones that, as an update is coming into the local market, they are the only ones that can accept that update. We call it an unlocalized function. Um, so again, we use Drupal um, during that for the inheritance um, capabilities, too, to make it much more efficient. So we don't have to have a web manager assigned for all 137 locales. We have about 42 web managers. So success, we, um, through our process, we just recently um, were able to complete globalization in five days uh, for our Red Hat announcement. Um, so think about 12 weeks down to five days. And I know we can even do this much faster. There were um, a few reasons why we didn't make it even faster that we're working on now. So, and the goal is to actually be able to just queue everything up so we can launch on a single day in all markets. And we have the capability to do that. Um, we just haven't tested it yet. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about Drupal and how Drupal helps us. So for the developers, you're probably familiar. And we're on Drupal 8. Um, a page itself, so this is a page with all of the different lead space and bands. Our um, IBM implementation of Drupal is um, its not layout. It's not a layout builder. We call it page builder, and it's our own implementation. But it's really made up of the lead space 
and the bands. So if you think of a page as lead space and bands. Um, so that aligns then to um, within Drupal, when we're looking at the different bands within Drupal. So every band, every lead space is an entity. And then the elements within the band are also entities. Um, and then every page is a node, and then a lead space is a node, and a band is a node. Um, so you're probably all familiar with that. Um, so if we have our English master, then we move into, um, we create an English master from our US site. So the reason we do that is we want to allow our worldwide teams to continue iterating on content, but we want to know what we're globalizing is approved for globalization. Like they already know that it's performing well, it's the content that they want the geo markets to have, and the geo markets are ready to have it. Um, so when we create our English master, we create a complete copy of every node um, from the worldwide site. And this actually cuts the inheritance. So we can make changes on the worldwide site without it affecting our English master. Then as we build our locale pages, so from the English master, we would create our uh, UKEN page. Um, we would, when we create the locale, the only thing that actually gets copied is the page wrapper. And none of, not the lead space, not the, ba the bands. Um, but when our web manager or one of our content editors, editors in the local markets um, changes a band, then it creates a, a version of that band in that local market. So Drupal knows to, when they're going to, when going to the UKEN site, to look and see for each element of the page, the lead space and all the bands, is there a UKEN version? If, it is, if there is, it renders that. If not, it'll fall back to the English master. So this is how we, we use the inheritance capabilities. This is another um, part of Drupal that we enhanced is the TMG MG module, uh, the translation module. Um, and we set it up so that we can send content off for translation to our IBM in-house um, translation service provider. And it comes back in. We put in, um, we send it, it, we were able to send an XLIFT, and it also includes a JSON file with our operations data. And this is really an important element because that's um, the information that's used to bill. So when, every time we send a translation to our service provider, we have to pay for it. So it wasn't a matter of just figuring out how to send the page. We also had to figure out how to send the financial information so that we could be billed on the back end. So that's all sent over. It comes back into the, the module. Um, we then have two APIs, and one API sends out um, information to get segments um, so that we can have then our reviewers look side by side in Drupal to see the, um, the segments. And then also, we can look at a whole preview of a page. And then when we, up, when we decide to approve the page, we use this other API that sends out, um, looks at the whole, is able to assemble all the content back into a whole translation unit. So a translation unit is putting the segments back together that have been taken apart in the process of translation. Um, and this allows our, um, our translation QA specialists to look at all the content in context. So you'll, the next slide will start a uh, video. It is going to be a pretty long demo. It's about 14 minutes, so I'll warn you. But it's um, Anne-Marie walking through the whole globalization process so you can see how it works. As part of this globalization demo, I'm going to start at our master English language of the Cloud Red Hat page and request a translation into our master German and step through the workflow. So here we're looking at the master English version of the IBM Red Hat page. Clicking on the translate tab, 
opens our list of languages that are available for translation and localization. I'm going to locate the Master German translation and select to request translation. So selecting the language with our TMGMT contrib module enabled, we can click request translation. Clicking request translation will take us to the checkout form where we're going to look at our custom IBM translation service provider and the operational data and checkout settings that are required. Sometimes it's a little slow. This is a development server. On the checkout form, I'll enter a label. And select our translation provider. This is the pre-production environment. On the right hand side, based on our content model, all of the entity references are included as additional job items to send in the same request translation package. As part of our checkout settings, I'm required to submit a domain, charging agent, charging code, and business unit. This is all operational data that's required to submit from the IBM Drupal instance through to our translation service provider. I'll select cloud, are keeping our Drupal 8 as the charging agent, enter in my test charge code from the business unit, and the translation contact is pre-populated with my ID and click submit to provider. As part of this process, we're now submitting the translation XLIF outbound, as well as a JSON with the operational data. Taking a look at the operational data, we can see that the raw JSON submits the job ID, the job title, the domain, business unit, charging agent, charging code, and the contact email as part of the JSON as posted to the endpoint. As well as the outbound JSON, we also have our outbound XLIF file that has all of the translatable units as part of the content model and the content type defined as our source language EN and all of the translatable strings sent to the translation provider. I have as part of this demo previously submitted a translation to both Master Italian and Master French and have processed them through various stages of the workflow. Once the translation job has been processed by the service provider, it's returned into Drupal and coming in with a workflow status of needs review. Clicking on manage the job, it opens up our manage job form, showing us all of the job items that were included in that package. And our content editors for this master language can click on edit translation, which opens our side-by-side -side comparison form. A quick scan of this shows us all of the segmentation, JSON, and its source on the left and our translations on the right. As a translation QA specialist for this master language, they can review side by side each of the translations and validate for correctness. If there's any additional updates, they can make, be made here and be resubmitted back to the translation provider. We can also do a preview of the translation. Clicking on preview will save a draft of any edits that are made as part of the side-by-side -side editing experience and will be available in context in rendering. So here we can see this is now the Italian translation for the IBM Red Hat page. And we can see if there's any corrections, errors or omissions, or any updates that need to be made prior 
to approving the translation. Once the translation has been reviewed, any corrections made, we can submit for review. From the comparison form, the translation QA specialist can submit this translation through to the approver for this master language. I have, as part of a previous translation, processed the master French into this status. So the status changes from needs review to needs approval. From this point, we can manage the translation job for the approval state. The difference on our overview form is that it's no longer an edit translation, but a review translation. Clicking on review translation opens our comparison form in a read only state for our translation approvals. We can also preview the translation and see again in context prior to approving the translation. Our translation editors in the contextual rendering of the preview can see the job information and we have this moderation bar that's available to allow them to approve the translation while they're previewing it in context. They can also, from the comparison form, approve the translation. Both will publish and move all of the job items into an accepted state and publish the master language translation. Any corrections that will have been made will be submitted through to our translation service provider and will update and validate those translations in memory. Doing so will mean that a second translation request for the same segment will come back as a validated translation and will not need to go back through the translation QA process again. So now that we have approved our translations, we can have our locale editors use our master languages to create localized versions of the IBM Red Hat page. I'm going to start with our master English and create one of our tier one locales for the IBM Cloud Red Hat page and I'll create the UK version of the page. From the translate tab, again, we see the list of all of the available locales. I'm going to choose the United Kingdom and instead of a request translation, I'm going to do an add for a locale. Clicking on add will open up the edit form for this page. The first choice that our locale content editors make is what is the parent source language that they want to use and inherit the content from. This is a list of all the published languages and locales. For E and UK, I'm going to choose the English master and click on confirm. At this point, all of the content fields are read only until they confirm which language they want to source those, those fields from. I can now see that my source language has been set to English master. The locale of this node entity is UKEN and all of my entity references as part of the content model are sourced from my parent source language, which is ENU, Master English. So Leadspace and Band are all sourced from Master English. A quick save and preview will show that my rendering logic is going to check for the current entity in its language code and if it doesn't find a revision for that translation language, it will fall back to the parent source language, Master English, and render its revision. So here I have my lead space, and I also have my band, which is inheriting from Master English. If a locale wants to, to localize one of its content items, 
So if I want to do an override of my inheritance, I can click edit. And I will edit the lead space and create a localization. We now we can see that the source is still inheriting from Master English. And I will simply add UK as part of my headline. And we see we have the option to localize this lead space. Once I've clicked localize this lead space, we now have a localized language variant of this lead space entity reference in the source language of ENUK. Save and preview picks up on my rendering logic where it will check, do I have an ENUK revision for this translation affected? Yes, then let's render it instead of inheriting the master English. This process works for all of our languages and their locales. So even our translated languages. So if I choose to create a localized version of my Spanish from, you'll see that it's inherited from my master Spanish. And we can see that this locale for Spain is inheriting all of its master language from the translation of ES. Should this locale want to create a localization, process would be the same. And here we see the source is master Spanish. Great edit. And in this case, I'm also going to remove the call to actions in the lead space. So in addition to making content edits, they can also add or remove custom content entity references from the page. And I'll click localize this lead space and save and preview. So while this translated locale is taking advantage of the QA'd and approved master Spanish translation, they also have the flexibility of being able to add and remove custom blocks from their page, as well as localize any of the content on the, for their locale. So with the use of a custom translation provider with our side-by-side -side translation QA process, storing translated memory or segmentation of our translatable units of our content models, as well as the ability to reuse master languages translation at the locales, this all gives us the benefit of faster time to market for creating localized versions of our content for Drupal. Thank you. So now I'm just going to take you really quickly through some of the updates, um, the customizations that have been done for our Drupal system. And again, this, these are Anne Marie's charts, so I'm going to do the best to represent them. Um, for her, but we also have contact information at the end of the presentation if you want to reach out to her, and I'm sure she will be glad to go into more detail with you. 
Um, so one of so we really looked at several different things to enable the core and the supporting contrib modules, and I'll go into each of these on, on detailed slides. Um, so the first one is that um, it's really important to get your content ready for globalization. So for each content model, um, our development teams um, for each of our different page types have to define um, which, um, let me turn this down, sorry, um, which, uh, w what the English length of the content is, what the translated length can be, if the content can be localized, and also um, if it's a required field. So this has actually been one of our issues during globalization that have, has gotten us into trouble. If the development teams aren't defining these, um, sometimes we've had failures when we send our content out to translation and back because the content coming back is too big for the field. So that's a really important thing for developers to focus on. Um, so we've written, um, she's written a whole module around this to help with that. Um, and this, again, is about the, the character length um, as well, making sure this is the actual module that checks the link um, before it goes out. Um, she's also developed, um, her and her team, modules to support um, the localization. So since we need to know whether um, a published version in the CMS is a language master, which will not render, versus a locale version, um, there's code that actually sets that, so um, if it's a, a master language, it results in a, in a, a false, and then if it's, um, if it's a locale, it, it renders a true. So for any places where we need that information, we're able to have that coded within the system um, to pick up um, to know how to render. Um, also, the content inheritance, so um, having a way with our translation helper to know all those inheritance. So when I said we asked the GEO teams to define the parent and the children, um, that's all defined within the system, and there's a module that goes, knows to go look for that as far as the rendering. Um, our outbound um, translation request, so this is in that um, TMGMT, so this is the, the extra customization module that was created to send the content to our internal translation service provider and bring it back in the format that we need within the module. And then this is the piece um, that pulls the pieces, the segments back together um, and helps us do um, make sure at the end of the process we, we update our translation cache. And I didn't talk as much about that as I, I wanted to, but we want to send, we want to make sure every time we do a translation, and the reason we're using translation QA team members, we don't want to change the messaging, we want to have an exact translation, and we want to optimize that during this process so that over time our translation memories are being optimized overall driving down our translation costs. So we won't, as we see the same um, term, we'll, it'll be handled by machine learning versus having to have a, a human involved. And this is the side-by-side -side, um, module capability that was built in to allow our translation QA team members to do that side-by-side -side validation. This is the assembling back. API. Um, again, this will be all there for you to reference. And finally, I just want to say, so um, the key step, steps to success are really, first, understanding what your business problems are with globalization that you're trying to resolve, and then developing a strategy around to solve that for that, including KPIs. So we knew we want to get to two weeks as for every one of our globalization projects as a maximum. So we've got our eye on, the, on that goal, and everything we're doing is trying to get to that goal. Um, we then aligned our processes to the strategy. We aligned our roles and responsibilities and our staffing to our processes. And then we implemented um, functionality within the platform to support all of our needs. So that's what I have to share. And um, 
We've got some connection information if you want to get in touch. Um, and don't forget to go to contribution tomorrow. And we'd love to have your feedback on the session. So thank you. And I can take questions if anyone has questions. I can't tell if there's. OK. <laughs> I'll let you. No. I can I can hear you, I think. Um, so we actually have divested of our um, content management system. Um, and so when we were looking at choosing a, um, a CMS, I think we, we knew um, that was happening. Um, and we probably had about 50 people across our uh, marketing organizations and our engineering teams involved in reviewing input from several different vendors. Um, Acquia was um, the one who presented Drupal, and, and Acquia was um, ultimately the vendor we chose to get started with. Um, for our implementation. And um, if you want to learn more about that, the Seattle um, recording for DrupalCon, there's a, um, how, to, how to get Big Blue to dance, I think is the topic um, title. Um, so you can learn more, a little bit more about that. But um, we also were looking for an open source solution. Our engineers wanted um, a solution that they could customize and they can contribute back. Um, to the community, um, and so we just wanted something that would address our needs. And um, the inheritance capabilities of Drupal, I don't know if any other um, system has that, but that's really been um, important for us as far as our, our marketing efficiency goals. Any other questions up from here? Web sphere. So there's probably more irony now in this than I can even <laughs> comprehend. Uh, Things are always changing. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I think we made the right choice back then. Uh, so we've had a long journey now with Drupal already, and we're actually now going through a similar exercise where we are uh, changing our approach from having almost 60 so-called full sites into these kind of tiers. Um, so I'm interested to learn more about how you made the, the decisions and got the buy-in, because my experience is that if you ask, uh, people have a strong uh, inclination towards, you know, let's keep the status quo, we want to have the full site, so how you were able to get the buy-in and able to move into these tiers? Uh, I think data is the key. Like, data was our, our source and our friend. We, you know, had our, our research team really look, do a deep analysis and come back with data. Um, we could go to the marketing teams and wherever there was any kind of pushback, we said, okay, well, let's look at your data. Let's look at your traffic. Let's look at your revenue. Let's look at your resources. Let's look at the numbers. And so just focusing on data, it took all the emotional emotion out of it, like was the best approach. Okay, great. So that's our plan, so hopefully. <laughs> Sounds like we're doing the right thing, so yes. thanks. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you all, and um, thank you for the video, going through the video, and uh, thanks for a great DrupalCon. This is my first one, like I said before. It's been great. Thanks.